The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. In articulate speech of the heart. In articulate speech, in articulate speech of the heart. In articulate speech, in articulate speech of the heart. Hello and welcome to It's Your Voice, the show that hosts enriching conversations in diversity and we're including conversations on climate change and climate justice. My name is Bahia Yaksan. I'm a core alignment coach, an emotional wisdom training specialist and have been a diversity educator for decades. Before I introduce our guest today, I wanted to let folks know if you're interested in the programs I coach to individuals or groups, schools, organizations, in helping you identify patterns of behavior that are harmful to yourselves or others that you'd like to learn to step out of and to cultivate new patterns that create more belonging and space and inclusion of other voices. You can find examples of the programs I offer on my website, which is called Know What You Want, coaching.wordpress.com. Today, I'm really excited to have a guest who was actually the second guest I ever had when I began this show when it was uh, only a podcast without camera. Now we have camera. My guest name is Robert Shetterly. He is an American artist who is an, also an activist and a teacher. He has done a series of, of portraits and one that is, um, he probably is most known for, and perhaps I think the most ongoing one is called Americans Who Tell the Truth. He uh, resides in Maine with his partner, Gail, and was for many years the president of the Union of Maine Visual Artists and, a, and is a producer of a Maine Visual Artists pr uh, Project, which is a, a Maine Masters Project which is a series of documentaries about Maine artists of which he is now the subject of one. And it's wonderful to see um, this film highlighting Robert himself and his work. Robert Shetterly, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being back. <laughs> Hi, Bahia. It's hey. wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for inviting me on. Oh, I'm just really honored and I've been really excited ever since I learned that um, Maine Masters uh, was going to do a documentary on you, which is called Truth Tellers, which um, highlights your series called Americans Who Tell the Truth. Mm -hmm. Yes, I actually had to re retire from the uh, being the head of the Union uh, um, of Maine Visual Artists because I couldn't uh, have the program, you know, them do a documentary about me and still be part of the organization. So uh, in order for that to work, I had to uh, go into a uh, step down, as you say, in order to step up. <laughs> well, yeah, you're, you're, pr you're plenty prolific in doing so much else for the world. And that's one, one reason I'm so grateful for your work in the world, because talk about an example of someone who aligns his work and what you dedicate your time to with your values. It's just really like reassuring to me, inspiring and encouraging. And I'm just really grateful for what you brought into the world and, and look forward to more of it. <laughs> and I, I know one thing you I, I read was that when you originally started portraits uh, of Americans who stood out to you and inspired you, who tell the truth, you thought maybe it would maybe 50 or so, but um, you've been inspired. Your inspiration <laughs> has continued. And I know you're like, if uh, you have painted over 260 portraits at this point in time, is that right? Yes, it uh, has gotten to be an obsessive compulsive disorder. <laughs> but I, 
Now, I, my goal was to paint 50 portraits. I had, in fact, never painted a portrait in my life. I mean, I, I was a surrealist artist. I did put faces and figures in my paintings, but usually distorted in one way or another to create some kind of effect or poetic effect or amb ambiguity. But um, in order to do this project, I wanted to uh, honor the people that I was painting by not burdening any of them with any sort of stylistic thing about myself. Instead, I wanted to honor them by, to the best of my ability, paint their wisdom, paint their integrity, paint their courage, you know, paint their spirit, if I could, and kind of be behind the scenes, you know, and uh, and then, you know, as you know, each painting is quite large. They're on wooden panels, and they're, they have a quote from that person scratched into the surface. So, you know, each painting is meant to be kind of a confrontation where, and a friendly one, where the person in the painting is, in most cases, looking directly at you, and um, asking with their eyes something of you, and then with their words, they're asking something else of you, uh, you know, to be fully present to the issues that they are concerned about. And, you know, when I began this project, it was stimulated by the American run-up to the Iraq War in uh, 2001, two, and three. And I was, um, you know, I was just so upset about that this was happening and being allowed to happen and the, the major media was cheerleading for it and it was abundantly clear that our government was lying about the reasons for the war and i you know i've lived long enough in this country i'm 76 years old i lived through the vietnam area and everything since then and every war that this country has been part of since in my adult life has been lied about you know whether it's Vietnam itself, or you know what happened in Central America, uh, Panama, Grenada, the first Gulf War, this Gulf War, uh, the Iraq War, you know it's just one thing after another. And I was thinking, you know, what am I going to do about this? How am I going to live in this country, feeling this way? How am I going to allow myself to be made complicit once again um, in a war crime? But am I going to do that? Am I going to stay in this country or am I going to go somewhere else? Am I going to, or am I going to find some way to be a, a, a much more effective and full-time activist with my art, you know, and not just in my, like I did in my surrealist art, comment on things, but actually engage in a way uh, in terms of education and history that I had never been able to do before. And uh, there were, another important thing was going on there that I was, I was so upset, I was actually, I think, making myself sick because mm. of my, um, I mean, I, I could feel it, uh, that I was mm -hmm. endangering myself because I had all this pent up anger that was let out in ranting, but not in anything positive. And I realized I had to do something positive with that energy. And it, it finally, it occurred to me that maybe the best thing to do was to stop ranting about people in the government who were lying about creating a war and surround myself with Americans who made me feel good. You know, that I called truth tellers because they were the ones who have tried to insist that this country live up to its own ideals. And they often did this at, um, you know, it took great perseverance. It takes great courage. Um, it takes a lot of organizing skills and um, a willingness to take big risks with your life often in order to strangely, ironically, do the what would you think would be the simplest thing is to stand up for the basic values of the country. You know, what's that about? And that's this project in, in, the, in, the, in order to do this thing, to carry it on now for, you know, over 20 years, has, um, you know, it taught me a lot about, about history, about how change happens, about, and particularly about the resistance to change. You know, why is it that there is so much resistance in, in a country like this to its own values being made real for everyone. So that's what, in this project then has become all about that. Um, and it's tried to be as eclectic as possible. And also its major focus is not, is not on, um, you know, icons. I mean, there are plenty of icons in the, the collection, 
there's you know Frederick Douglass, there's Susan B. Anthony, there's you know Martin Luther King Jr., there's Rosa Parks, people like that. But there are you know 250 other people who are um, many of whom you would have never heard of. And in fact, I had never heard when I started this project. And in a, in a sense, this project has also been kind of crowdsourced because once I started doing it and people got aware of it, I am deluged with suggestions practically every mm. day. You know, people sending ideas. And many of them are just wonderful stories of people that I knew nothing about that uh, mm. I'm delighted to find out about. And often that's where a new painting comes from. So it's been a, it's been a, um, I would say a vertical learning curve for me to be doing this work <laughs> and, and totally consuming. It's been wonderful. I learned so much uh, watching the documentary Truth Tellers uh, and learned about Americans in our history that I did not know about either. And I so appreciated, mm -hmm. I so appreciated um, understanding more about how change has happened, how it does happen. And, and that you pointed, one thing you pointed out in the fil film is how, and I think that's is what you're saying is the, the resistance to change is ironic. If our, if our foundational values are uh, about the freedom for all and, and having everyone count, that um, the change makers have, are usually, are always coming from people who have been marginalized and yeah. who and with tremendous courage risking their lives. Absolutely, I mean, it's, it's rare when people with uh, power and profit and prestige and the ability to shape the laws of the country, you know, look at the that situation and realize that it's skewed in their favor and think that it should be changed. I mean, most often, you know, people in that kind of position are very resistant to change. And, you know, um, as Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never will and it never did. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's that kind of uh, demand that has been put up on it by, you know, every one of the people I painted in, in one form or another with different and, and varying kinds of success. But uh, often there has been success and there's been a lot of backsliding too. But it's, you know, every time that people show that kind of um, courage to, you know, face up against that kind of resistance, uh, even if they don't succeed, they they pave the way for other people to do it. I mean, we if people don't do that, you know, even in the face of defeat, um, you know, that acquiescence breeds a kind of apathy and cynicism and despair in everyone else. Mm -hmm. But when we see that heroic struggle going on, uh, we try to match it as best we can, or at least many people do, and that's uh, that's what's so exciting about many of the people I painted is that, you know, that continuum that's been there since, um, you know, the very signing of our constitution when it was betrayed at the signing, you know, because it said, all, you know, it was all built on justice, but it was only given to rich white men. And, you know, ever since then, th those marginalized people, you know, have had to make that struggle themselves. I'm, I'm, there's so many um, follow-up questions I have, but I'm wondering if this might be a good time to um, show the trailer and sort of add to our conversation and sure. uh, let, letting the listeners and viewers get a glimpse of the trailer of this documentary, um, which is just packed with not only like accurate historical information that's been omitted from typical American history books and classes, um, but also like incredibly um, inspiring, hope hope producing <laughs> stories, despite all the pain. Mm -hmm. DJ, do you mind um, sh opening that link now for the trailer to The Truth Tellers? In the Americans Who Tell the Truth portrait series, I was thinking about using art as therapy. I was very angry about where this country was going as we were being led into another war that didn't need to be fought. And I thought, you know, what can I do? 
The Earth is in charge, the cosmos is in charge, nature is in charge, we are. Thank goodness our attempts at genocide of Native people were not successful. And when you see us as humans, we can better advocate for our rights to clean air and water. Listen, there are other ways to make money. This is not only about equality, it's about existence. If y'all just witnessed something amazing, I want you to say, yeah! Yeah! All right, can you hear that world? Yeah! yeah! And these young people are the moral leaders of our time. And unless millions of students are not coming to see themselves as activists for climate justice, then we're doomed. Today, we make a change! Why was that so scary? It was really just me trying to change something in my own backyard, right? I come against you in the name of God! This is what I come down today! Courage is about the belief that there is something greater than your fear. It is about staring down fear and having faith that we can make a better world. I tasted the bitter fruits of segregation and I didn't like it. I got in trouble. It was good trouble, necessary trouble. That's how we know who we are, by knowing these stories, identifying with these people, because that's where the best of this country is. That brings me to tears again. Wow. And that was just two minutes and 18 seconds. <laughs> oh, we have a comment here. I'll read for uh, listeners who can't see the video. Um, but Dr. Reverend, Reverend Dr. Nancy Kennedy is writing, I like what Robert Shutterly has to say. I believe that many wars that we've been involved in is about power and money, not peace for the common man, woman. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Nancy. No, that, that, that's certainly true. Yes, and, and uh, you know, that's uh, is so discouraging. Um, and, you know, it's interesting how this war in Ukraine right now, um, whatever you, or how we want to analyze, you know, the origins of it and, and the role that the United States played in actually making it possible. It's, it's distressing to see some of the same people who were encouraging the Iraq war, which was also a war crime, uh, using this war to kind of greenwash themselves, you know, or if that's the right term uh, mm -hmm. for when you're trying to make yourself look good after you've committed a war crime by concentrating on, to find, to try to set yourself up on a higher ground. I mean, the things that uh, the Russians and the Putin government have been doing in terms of the, the way they've attacked civilians and the uh, particular things they've attacked, infrastructure, housing, water, electricity, uh, people, you know, those horrible things they've done. Um, in Iraq and Afghanistan, we were doing exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. And maybe even more systematically during the first Gulf War and then the Iraq War, we're targeting all of those same kinds of things, water treatment plants, electric grids, food supply. I mean, just awful, awful crimes. And of course the war itself was a crime, but you know, that, you know, now we're in a position where we can blame these kinds of things on other people and make ourselves look good. War is a horrible, horrible thing. It does not accomplish, you know, politically and certainly not morally, you know, whatever anybody says it's supposed to do. And the only people that, uh, well, let's just say, I wouldn't say the only people, but the people who make out every time is a war are, you know, the, the weapons manufacturers, the war makers, the suppliers. You know, they, and also in this country, they, with the revolving door between that and the Pentagon and the State Department and uh, the government itself, you know, these people go in and out of these institutions and continue to, you know, encourage these kinds of wars and because they're making billions and billions of dollars. Um, and it's just, it's so distressing. And that's, 
you know, that was the thing that was happening in around the Iraq war, which was clear to me that I wanted to make a statement about. Um, but then, you know, the more you look at it and we take, you know, we talk today about how everything is systemic and all these issues are interrelated. And of course they are, um, you know, we look at you know, whether we're talking about race or gender or environment, climate, uh, you know, all these things, workers, um, these are all part of the same problem. The same people are, are coming out ahead on top. The same people are engineering outcomes, which are not good for the mass, the, the most people, or as Dr. Kennedy said, the common people. Uh, you know, we want not only to uh, create a, 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 a culture of dignity for the common people, and we want to do it for the common good. And, you know, any society that calls itself a democracy and doesn't do that is not a democracy. You know, we've got, you know, all this concern today about, you know, voter suppression and all the different things that people are saying, well, or, or you know, January 6th, and, you know, these are the attacks on democracy. Well, yeah, these are attacks on democracy, but democracy has been under attack before we even wrote the Declaration of Independence. I mean, it's mm -hmm. been, you know, a system that was, you know, primarily for uh, people of, of wealth and power and primarily kept that way with, uh, you know, the way that uh, corporate money is in our system and the way the, the laws are written to uh, allow that kind of distortion of, of what should be democratic process, uh, fair wages, you know, health care and an education system that actually levels the playing field rather than than uh, puts it more of a, you know, a, 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 a diagonal. Um, you know, those, those things happen, and, and that's been going on forever, and it's that, that's the struggle. By the way, I want to say just is a, the, uh, I, didn't, I don't think I mentioned his name, and it was, you know, on the screen there, but that film was made by Richard Kane, who lives in, in Sedgwick, Maine, and is uh, an old friend of mine, and, and I, I just think it's made a huge difference to my work and uh, the awareness about the America to Tell the Truth project. Once that, that film has been out, it's been playing all over the country. It's been in a lot of film festivals. It's going to be on main public uh, television uh, in February a couple of times. And it's um, last last summer, it played at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington. And that was wonderful. And there's a big crowd and, and uh, we, we unveiled a new portrait there. And it was just, it was wonderful to be in that space with that with that film. Well, thank you. I too want to shout out Richard Kane, who has um, been a great support to so many growing filmmakers and artists in Maine for a lot of years. And uh, Melody, uh, who's right. a, a, another part of the Kane Lewis production team. And uh, yeah, his documentaries, which you have been a producer of, of right. uh, Maine Masters are, um, they're all really inspiring. And um, he's got a, quite a collection himself <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of good work, which you have helped produce. <laughs> but well, I, I, I was just gonna say, it's been a lot of fun for me. I mean, Dick shoots the film and he edits them and stuff, but uh, on many of them, I've been the, the person who interviews the, the artists. And that's always exciting for me. We often pick people that I haven't known well and I have to study up on their art and then think about how to, you know, ask interesting questions. And uh, it's, it's really been fun. Clearly a, a great collaboration, <laughs> very effective and productive. Let me, uh, let me tell you about something that's going on with this project right now that is, I think, one of the most significant things that uh, has happened. We, For about nine years, we've been uh, very much involved with the uh, different programs at Syracuse University. It began with uh, some interest in the uh, at the Maxwell School, which is a school for public policy and citizenship at Syracuse, sort of like the JFK School at Harvard. And um, it's, it has the, it, that, that reputation. And they were bringing in uh, a lot of people from uh, North Africa and the Middle East to study at the Maxwell School to learn about how American democracy is supposed to work. And I had a show at a gallery in Syracuse, and a person who was in charge of that 
uh, project, bringing those people from the Middle East, uh, saw the show and then brought all those people. These were sort of mid-career people. They were teachers, uh, they were activists, they were uh, doctors, lawyers, all kinds of folks. Um, smart people, you know, to see these, to see a collection of my portraits. And it was one of the most exciting things. I mean, my initial thought was that they, um, you know, they don't know who these people are. They wouldn't get it. But the language that is on, the, the, the idealistic language that is, you know, thrashed into the surface of the paintings appealed directly to them. And some of the best conversations about American history, how you make change, you know, how you, who could take those kinds of risks uh, to try to make that change happen in that kind of setting. Mm -hmm. Right now, Maxwell School is doing something else, though, which I, I am just thrilled about. They, if, if you go to Syracuse and they go to the Maxwell School, which is this huge uh, Greek revival building with these giant pillars that go up four stories, and you, know, you, you come through those pillars and go into this uh, foyer, which must be, I don't know, 40 feet long, 20 feet high, this huge white space, sort of like a church-like space. Mm -hmm. And there's only one, or has for more than 70 years been only one thing in that space, which was a full-size bronze statue of George Washington. Well, mm -hmm. the, the, the new dean there, Gladys McCormick of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, thought that was a little problematic, that uh, here was another founding father who owned slaves, mm -hmm. who sharpened his military skills by killing indigenous people. And he is standing, you know, godlike in this space without any questions about who he was or how he came to be there or what he stood for. So what she decided to do was bring 10 of my portraits into that space to be on the walls around him to create a conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and is asking students and faculty to come there and role play. So in that space now on, on one side of him is Frederick Douglass. On the other side is Malcolm X. And then there's Grace Lee Boggs, the organizer from Detroit. Warren Lyons, the great native leader. Susan B. Anthony is there and, and five other portraits. And they are all in, I would say, respectful conversation with George right. Washington. You know, wow. what, do they, what do they learn from him? What could he learn from them? And what would they say to each other? I mean, what would Malcolm, Malcolm X say to George Washington? What would George say to him? And, um, you know, that's so interesting. Um, and um, they planned every year to bring in 10, 10 new portraits and created slightly different conversations. Hmm. What, what that did for me was to make explicit something that was implicit in this project from the very beginning, which I hadn't even realized myself that that was the conversation that was going on, that this was a conversation with this country, it was a conversation with our history, that all these people I, were paint, I was painting, that's what this is about. And it isn't, you know, a, a shouting match, you know, it's a, it is a kind of, um, it's not even exactly a protest, it's, it's an affirmation of people who have taken the, the, the actual words of our ideals to heart and tried to base their concern for their own lives and for their communities on those words and, and the ultimate meaning of them and not allow them to be the property of just a few people um, and for them to be then exploited by those few people who claim to own those words. And I, I'm just so thrilled that Syracuse had that vision uh, to put this project in conversation with a founding father. Um, anyway, that's that's something that's happening right now, and I'm just delighted about it. Oh, that is thrilling. That's really good to hear. I love that, and the, and it's also innovative because it's. And then there are, I totally support times and places when statues that represent oppression are moved and shifted to somewhere else. But I, something interesting about this is they said, no, let's keep Washington here. And have him in conversation with these. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's different than you know. In the film, you see the uh, some really exciting footage from uh, Charlottesville, yes. and the young woman, uh, you know, who's 
uh, fighting to uh, you know get those statues removed there. Zion yes. Bryant, who was just right. 15 when, when she um, you know started that petition. So and you know, there's there's really not much point in having a conversation like of this with uh, say Robert E. Lee or Stonewall Jackson, you know somebody who is actually fighting and killing, you know to preserve slavery or um, fighting and killing to preserve a way of life that supports, you know, the genocide of indigenous people. That conversation should have been over a long time ago. Yes. But, but the conversation with George Washington, who was a man of some, you know, definitely of, of moral and physical courage, who was also embedded in the system, the way all of us are embedded in these systems, mm. you know, and we can't see our way out of them at times. I mean, there are, economy and culture is structured today to you know to embed us in these systems so that you know to do the right thing about climate change for instance it, with everything we do is is damn near impossible you know the, the stuff we buy the way we transport ourselves um you know just the way we do almost everything uh, the clothes we wear uh, it's it's all the food we eat it's all embedded in systems that are um you know, at war with, with our own sustainable uh, lives and with the future. Mm. That's a good way to put it, at, at war with sustainability. I was thinking about, um, I read that you said, I don't know if you said it also in the documentary when you were talking about what a democracy depends on the truth and if we're not hearing it from the government and we're not hearing it in the media um that's why we need the pe people like the people you're painting and and to not only recognize that and respect and honor that courage but to be moved by it and hopefully move ourselves into more courageous acts that we're taking right now because it, it's easy to get lost in the war against, you know, because we're so embedded. Mm -hmm. um, well, we live in a time that's like a hall of mirrors right now. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's in regard to what the truth is and the way people are spinning it and, and uh, uh, you know, insisting on fighting for things that are, you know, patently false and pretending they're true. Um, for in a, and not even it's not because they're misinformed. It's because they are thinking they can get some kind of uh, political or cultural edge, you know, by doing the things they're doing, saying the things they're doing. I mean, you can't have a uh, successful political society unless leaders are telling the truth. I mean, is to the best of their ability. I mean, if people are not doing that. How could you? How in the world can you trust them? And if you can't trust people, um, there's actually no hope that you're going to solve your problems. And that is a, you know, has become now a, a structural problem in this country, is that lack of trust um, that, mm -hmm. that leaders, you know, are actually trying to solve problems, and rather than you know leading us in some other direction for some other uh, group's benefit that we. Uh, have a hard time understanding just who that might be, although in most cases it has to do with with money, of course. But uh, I mean that that issue just on the on the very, the very surface of it is uh, just you know what happens to a society where people aren't telling the truth. You know, there's no trust, and then there's no hope. And so, uh, you know, one thing this you know we're trying to do with the Americans Tell the Truth project is tell the truth about our history. Uh, tell the truth about what the problems are, and and then knowing that truth about what the problems are, we we were saying if you really want to solve them, um, knowing that truth is the way you're going to solve them. Otherwise, you're not, you know. And so, uh, you know, at the very basis of you know any uh, social interaction, uh, that regard for the truth has to be paramount. Otherwise, you, you can't survive. And I think that that, um, you know, as much as all the uh, attacks on that are being against democracy and everything else, probably the most, the more significant one is the undermining of the idea that people can believe 
in in the leaders that they've actually you know voted for or maybe not voted for but that that shouldn't be a problem i mean we should be people on both sides of whatever issue there should be struggling towards some kind of truth and then at least finding something that they can agree on because there there has to be something there that is true that which would guide us forward hmm. This is such a great way to, I mean, there are so many people who um, like myself and my generation and <laughs> previous generations and current generations who are not having access to the truth just in history. And I think it is um, your metaphor of the hall of mirrors is, is very powerful and it seems even more difficult for people to believe and discern what is true. And I, I, I want everyone to access <laughs> this documentary <laughs> because it's a good guide to um, not only well, the, the Go ahead, go ahead, please. I was gonna say one of the things that's, that's featured in the documentary are at, at least three young women, maybe four. Um, you know, there's, and, and, it, and they have a, well, it's so interesting to think of these young women in relationship to truth telling. Mm. Um, I mean, we everybody's familiar with Greta Thunberg, of course, um, and you know the power that she has accrued around herself by very simple and powerful truth telling. Mm -hmm. You know that, that you know European parliaments and governments, you know, applaud her when she tells them that they're lying and that they're you know, endangering the future of the planet. And there's something so clear about what she's saying and so undeniable about it. And it is particularly powerful coming from that source, you know, a 15 year old girl. Um, it, it, it's, it's interesting how uh, adults, it's not only allow themselves, I would say even want themselves to be told the truth, frequently, and especially by a child, hmm. you know, because they've, there's so much distrust between adults amongst themselves about the motives of other people. The motives of Greta Thunberg are never in question. And, you know, in, the, in our project, in Americans Who Tell the Truth, uh, we have featured a lot of young people now. In the film, you saw Bree Newsom, who she, she wasn't quite that young. I mean, she was in her 20s and climbs the flagpole and takes down the Confederate flag in Charleston, yeah. South Carolina, or Columbia. And, or, and then you see, you know, um, Zayana Bryant, the 15-year-old who starts the discussion about taking down the monuments. You see Kelsey Juliana, who uh, you know, works with our Children's Trust to start a suit against the United States uh, to make our policy uh, come into line with, with climate science. You know, all these young girls and it, you know, I was thinking about that the other day, and I was thinking about that in relationship to, to Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. You think, oh, is this guy crazy? <laughs> but you know, when you look closely at that story, that's what it's about. You know, there are three adults, I mean, besides Eddie M and Uncle Henry and whatever it is, you know, <laughs> there, there are three adults in the story. And, you know, the Scarecrow, the Tin Woodman, and, and the Lion. Yeah. And they all think that they're missing, you know, courage, a heart, and intelligence. And she leads them on a, a journey in which they find that they can, that it's there in them all the time, that they didn't know it. But they have to be taught by a girl mm. who is, you know, courageous enough and vulnerable enough to take them on that journey to teach themselves that they have those talents already. And, and that's kind of the, or those virtues, those ideals, those values. You know, that's kind of the position we're in at this moment in, in our history, is we need to be taught by our own children. Adults do, mm. you know, better access to our own virtues, our own courage, our own intelligence, our own heart, you know, which by means compassion and kindness. You know, we need to be taught by our kids how important these things are. And in fact, we have them already. We just have to be willing to, you know, embrace them and then use them. And, and that's, uh, that's one of the reasons I just painted a, a um, 
last year, a girl from, a black girl from Bridgeport, Connecticut named Jasa Hunter Mellers, who was uh, suffering. They, she lived in the poor part of town, uh, you know, a, a ghetto-like area. And, and like a lot of American cities, all of the, um, you know, terrible industrial practices were stuffed into that area. You know, they had the coal-fired power plant, the waste disposal plant, the, you know, you know, the garbage, this and that. Everything was there. The air quality is absolutely terrible. So lots of little kids and everybody else had, had asthma. They were getting diseases from breathing all these particulates and toxins. And there was an organization that had started to try to get the, the power plant taken down. And Jason and her mother went to one of these meetings and Jason discovered or and everybody discovered at the same time that this 10 year old kid had an incredible ability to stand up and become the face of that organization hmm. and to demand that this power plant be taken down because here was the kid who was suffering from the consequences of this kind of environmental racism. Hmm. He became the leader and that plant indeed was taken down. And, you know, it's, it's another case of that, that voice uh, of a young person, you know, carrying so much weight, you know, his little tiny kids with an enormous amount of weight. Uh, yeah. to cause uh, and allow for social change. So um, I'm, I'm actually more and more these days looking for, uh, you know, people like that, uh, who, young people who are uh, standing up for those kinds of causes. I, that makes me want to ask you, even though it sort of seems... Um... Uh, it obvious in a way, but because of the the innocence and the the absence of years of more conditioning that y young people have, um, what 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 do you think it is that's enabling us to hear them more clearly, like in, at this period of time? Well, I, I think that I first of all, I, I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, uh, what is it? And I suspect, well. I'm not sure that my my own uh, vision and knowledge may be clouded by what I would like to believe at this moment. But what I would like to believe is that many adults are very well aware of the mess we've made and the mistakes we've made, and we've failed to be good leaders. It, it isn't it isn't just our governments that have failed us. You know, we as citizens have failed us, and have so. failed. To, we've been made comfortable enough that we haven't had to take the risks to make uh, the kind of changes that will allow our own lives and especially our children and our grandchildren's lives to be sustainable and healthy on this planet. And I think we know that. And I think that we also know that we need to be excoriated for that. And, it, and when a, a young person speaks with that kind of moral imperative, uh, we're actually uh, waiting for it. We, mm. we know we know that it it's a right and righteous mm. voice for this moment and uh it, it's it may be the thing that that will uh you know really uh trigger the kind of uh change making that has to happen um, i mean there's a there's a moment in the film when the great educator bill uh, bigelow from uh, rethinking schools and the zen ed project you know says that you know unless you know millions of young people get in the streets about climate change um you know we're doomed he says and i think that you know well wait a minute why wouldn't uh, a million adults in the streets you know create the same uh alleviate the same problem well that's a good question and i think it's because you know he knows that kids at this moment have a little bit more skin in the game they also may have a persistence of, of, uh, of passion for this that adults uh, may not want to, you know, uh, indulge in. I mean, adults want to go home and have a glass of wine later. And uh, the kids realize that the stakes are bigger than that. I don't know. It's it's, it's an interesting thing. But I think my, my basic assumption is that uh, we listen to those kids. They have that kind of power because we want them to have that power. And we know that they're coming from a place that is uh, in, in their 
their anger and their innocence, which is appropriate for this moment. That really resonates. That 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 matches my experience of experiences of seeing people from you know who identify as boomers um like practically apologizing to their kids or nieces and nephews um i think you really hit something right right there yeah, yeah well, ready i mean i i you know just to be you know totally honest i mean i you know i i, I fault myself i mean there are certainly areas of my life where i think well you know, I, I haven't, is, even though I devote most of my time now to this project and particularly to education, I mean, I would like to talk a little bit about education with you. Um, even though I do all that, there's still many places where I could certainly pare down the way I use, you know, energy, the way I use, you know, other resources of, of the world and, and uh, the things that I do. Um, so many of us can do that, I think. I'm sorry I interrupted you there, but I feel I would love you to talk about education, but I also want to let you know we just have like three minutes left. Oh, so <laughs> this is a good time to put in your any uh, pitch for education and closing remarks, and we want to make sure we say uh, how well, people can find the film. Well, this project you know, began as a therapy project and a portrait project, and, and we used to think that the portraits themselves were the education. And then we got started getting invited into schools, and we needed a curriculum. And so we, you know, formed this Samantha Smith Challenge, uh, which is our uh, curriculum aimed at middle and high schools to get kids engaged with the issues that they're concerned about and actually doing something, you know, outside of the school to make a change so that they feel uh, less despairing, less cynical, and feel that, uh, that they can find hope by actually getting involved. And if somebody were interested in those, if they go to the Americans with Telling Truth website, they can read all about our educational initiatives and how to get involved in them. And that's become the real effort of this project now is aimed at, at that is, is aimed at education. And we believe that, you know, fundamental to amongst the other things we've already talked about, fundamental to the success of any democratic society is how we educate our kids. And you know, if we fail to do that, fail to tell them the truth about our history fail to show them how we they can change themselves, can change history, we have failed the, the idea of democracy entirely. Well put. <laughs> so thank you for mentioning uh, the Samantha Smith project, that it's an actual curriculum and the website is, is www.americanswhotellthetruth.org. Yep. And there are lots of resources and inspiration there. And also for people who want to order truth tellers, um, do we have a different website or is it Americans who tell the truth dot org for order? So if, if they want to get the, the film, it's uh, uh, truthtellersfilm.com. Um, they can see their trailer on the Americans who tell the truth website. We okay. also are, um, there are two new books out about this project, one on racial justice and one on earth justice, which they can find on the Americans who tell the truth website too. Fantastic. Robert Shetterly, thank you so much for this incredible work and the resources and the education and access to these resources so we can keep sharing it and spreading the word with more and more and more people. I'm really grateful for your work and your time. No, and I also want to thank the uh, listeners and the viewers today. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I always like to thank our engineer, DJ, and our producer, Dean Piper, and encourage everyone to tune in next Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern time on W4CY.com or Talk4TV to hear It's Your Voice. And may we all have enriching conversations in diversity this week. Thank you for listening. Thank you. In articulate speech, in articulate speech of the heart. In articulate speech, in articulate speech.